some critics have called it the best whiskey bar in America, and it's right here in Western Washington, talking about the Ballard Cut. And they don't just serve up critically acclaimed drinks and dishes, they are also making the world a fine whiskey inclusive. So here to tell us and show us more is the co-owner, Tommy Patrick. Tommy, good morning to you. Good to have you with us here. Thanks. Good morning to you too as well. Nothing like whiskey in the morning. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> 9, 10 a.m. I think it's time. Classic 9, 10 a.m. whiskey. And you brought uh, some samples of some of the, the fine whiskeys that you offer. And you, and you say this is pretty much what you do five nights a week at, at the restaurant. Yeah. So Tuesday through Saturday, I'm at the restaurant walking around, just helping to make sure that, you know, the restaurant runs like well, and when I'm not talking about whiskey, I'm just kind of running around making sure that all the tables are bust and running food and stuff like that. But typically what I do is just kind of walk around and answer questions about both the back wall and whiskey in general. And so before we try anything out, I really want to hear about your experience getting here before uh, Ballard Cut and why it's so important to you to make this inclusive. Um, my experience getting here before Ballard Cut comes from about 22 years in the restaurant industry. I started out as a dish boy just kind of like doing like prep cook stuff like that and just working as a, a weekend dishwasher at a greasy spoon over in Port Orchard, which is my mother's restaurant. So ended up just kind of working my way up from there, doing like like bar back, just doing like anything and everything you could possibly think of. Like what in the heck well. is going on here? We're looking at you with the <laughs> You <laughs> having some fun, Reeled I think. that in too. <laughs> yeah, clearly living my best life on top of that barrel over there, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I, I really enjoy having fun at work. It's just kind of something where I, I don't find the point of doing something so many hours of, of so many weeks out of the year unless you're having a good time. Absolutely. You know? So. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way we live here, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you work these hours, you, you got to have some fun, which is absolutely. why we bring in to bring in some fine whiskeys as well. Talk about uh, what we have here in front of us. Um, so this would be a very uh, typical around-the-world flight for me. Uh, this, is, this is probably the most common one that I do is just to answer, like, kind of like broad scope questions about whiskey where it's like you have Japanese, you have a couple different recipes of bourbon, you have rye, and then you have a, a sort of single malt scotch that's over there too. Yeah, is That's that my favorite, you're... you know? <laughs> Every, everyone's got their own, but it's also something that I like to be able to give somebody a little bit of, of exposure to these different things, just so that way, because it's kind of a, it's kind of kept as a secret to a bunch of people, and some people like will look down their nose at you if you don't know these certain things. And one of the things that I always like tell people right when they first come in is, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's no wrong way of answering my questions. I ask the same three questions every time I do it. What are you in the mood for tonight? What do you generally avoid in a whiskey? And roughly how much do you want all of it to cost? I didn't really come from money. So it's always been something for me that, like, my first couple of times going out by myself, like, I knew that my choices directly led to, like, what I was going to be able to order. Because yeah. I knew that there was, like, a high right. dollar amount of, like, what I could get. Right, so. and, and it could also lead to bankruptcy if you don't do it right. <laughs> yeah, if you don't honestly, know what yeah, you're doing. Totally. Okay, so we have a flight here. Yep. Uh, so let, let's get into it. What are we doing? So I always like to start off with something a little bit lighter. Uh, Hibiki is one of my absolute favorite brands of Japanese whiskey. Uh, in fact, this bottle right here, the 17-year, is the Japanese whiskey that got me into Japanese whiskey. It was the first time that I tasted something. I'll just kind of go like that for you. Um, it was the first time that I tasted something from uh, that style and genre of whiskey that I was like, oh, I have to pay attention to this. So uh, Hibiki translates as harmony. Um, also, synonyms would be like echo, resonance. Uh, it comes from Beam Suntory. Uh, they've been making whiskey uh, since 1923. Uh, the Hibiki brand has been around since 1989. The bottle is actually super intentional. It's pretty cool just because there's 24 facets on the bottle and there's 12 on the top, but the 24 facets are supposed to represent the 24 hours in the day, and also the 24 roughly two week long Japanese micro seasons. So Very it's kind of cool. interesting wow. to, to follow them on Instagram, but I also kind of feel like it's one of those, uh, like you know when you read like a horoscope and it's like just vague enough? <laughs> you <know? laughs> that you're like, it's it like, knows me. It can me. never be like totally wrong. It's like, ooh, mist in like whatever season. I'm like, oh, it's totally right, but then you read the next one and it also could, <laughs> you know? But it's an absolutely fantastic brand of Japanese whiskey, and, and I always recommend it. So I always do like, some different like, options for people. So this would be like your introductory, the Harmony that you can find around the 17, which is increasingly more rare, and the 30-year, which 
is a very difficult bottle to get your hands on. Interesting. Okay, so moving on to the, the bourbons now. What are we looking for in a good bourbon? Um, Well-roundedness in bourbon is something that's kind of hard to do. So when you get something that's smooth, that's got flavor, that's not flat, that's not over, overtly spicy, that's just got a bunch of different stuff going on, but also in the same sense, like is approachable, is very important. So Elijah Craig coming from Heaven Hill, uh, Reverend Elijah Craig was the first person to be credited with heavily charring the inside of the barrels. Oh. So that's kind of like a really important name in the bourbon in the bourbon history and stuff like that. So we get our own private barrels from them. Uh, that one's Ballard Cut Select, and then the 18 year, and then this would be considered uh, a 24 year Bourbon Valley, which was back in the day a straight to Japan export. So that one didn't make its way to the U.S. But, and it's available here now. Uh, yes and no. Oh. You know, um, it's available at the Ballard Cut and some other select places probably around the country, but like not too many other places have that. Around. All right, moving on now, what, what do we have here? William LaRue Weller uh, was a pioneer in making whiskey in 1849. He started doing what's referred to as a weeded bourbon, which simply means that there's no rye grain in the mash bill, that they would have replaced that out with a soft red winter wheat, which kind of translates into the red velvet bags next to it, which is or what Pappy Van Winkle is made out of. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard about no, that No, not familiar. So this is a 20-year-old weeded bourbon that is uh, one of the most popular whiskeys that's out there these days. It's a very uh, a delicious uh, bottle of bourbon. This is the 20-year variety of it. So one of the things that I like to do, like kind of what I was talking about over here, is this one's like $9 a pour. This one's like $50 a pour. I think this one's around like 85 And this is actually what Pappy Van Winkle made back in the 50s. So this one was distilled in 1952. Oh, wow. Bottled in 1964. And then this is actually like made by Julian Van Winkle in wow. the 50s. Wow, that's like so. a collector's item there. Let's move down to the single malts there at the end because yeah. that's, that's kind of where I tend to gravitate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Lagavulin means hollow of the mill and it's a, a little town that's about three miles north of Port Ellen on the island of Isla. Uh, single malt scotch is actually three different legal vernaculars in my world, uh, coming from a single distillery, 100% malted barley, and coming from the island of Scotland. So you can do single malt Japanese whiskey, single malt American whiskey, different stuff like that. But typically you're just going to like roast the barley with using peat as your source of fuel because the, uh, the Scots don't really have too many forests after the English decimated them in the 14 and 1500s. So the peat bogs is where they go. Yep, so they source all their water from there, and then they actually harvest the peat from there as well. That's fascinating. Well, Tommy Patrick, great to have you, man. Thanks, we, we We appreciate it, and yeah. uh, the place to go, the Ballard Cut in Ballard.